everybody. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast. We're glad that you are here to join us today. Um, it is another week. In fact, it is a week away from the Summer Spectacular. Summer Spectacular starts a week from tomorrow um, in which we have a lot of different games we're going to be playing. Um, and we're going to have party games. We're going to be joined here with the, the Dice Tower staff at the studio. Uh, we have Jenny, who joined us for the Spring Spectacular. We'll be coming back. Blake, one of our reviewers, and Eric Summer will be here. And Bonagore is going to show up at some point. One of us is going to pie the other person. I don't know who, actually. Um, so all that, we're going to do some silly games, some fun games. The Dice Tower Awards uh, winners will be announced during that time, as well as... Um, some announcements for upcoming stuff, which I can't tell you about, but it's cool. Some publishers are going to be announcing some things coming in the future. So all that's happening a week from Tuesday. All right, well, we have uh, a contest going on. We have three copies of The Loop. This is from Pandasaurus Games. It's the uh, reprint. The, actually, just to clarify, the one you see here on the wall is the uh, original version of the loop, but it's just it minor minor changes in theirs. This uh, is a game in which you are looping time, working together to stop doc to stop a person. Why do I pause before I say the person's name? Because the answer to today's question to enter this contest is what is the name of the antagonist in this game, the loop? So. To do, enter this, email us at contest at dicetower.com. In the subject line, put the word loop. In the body, put, what's the name of the antagonist? The bad guy. Uh, in this game. Uh, we got three copies. This is for people in U.S., Canada, and Australia. So, you have a week to enter this, but don't delay. Thank you, Pandasaurus, for sponsoring this. All right, what else is happening? Um... Well, we got a lot of uh, reviews. I know this because I've already recorded all mine. A lot of things coming out uh, this week, and I'll talk about that a little bit later in Dice Tower Productions. But for now, let's move. All right, welcome back, Board Game Breakfast. Last week we talked about, or last time I was on here, the lightsaber and resin printing. Today, we're doing a quick video. Now, again, if you want to see more about this, I just did a review of the Elgu Mars Pro 2 versus the Elgu Mars Pro 1. You see, those are crazy words that don't mean anything. Their intro level. Half a second. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sorry, we have some. We're trying to fix the problems. We don't know what the deal is. Wah! We'll be back. All right, welcome back, Board Game Breakfast. Last week we talked about, or last time I was on here, the lightsaber and resin printing. Today we're doing a quick video. Now, again, if you want to see more about this, I just did a review of the Elgu Mars. Pro 2 versus the Elgu Mars Pro 1. You see, those are crazy words that don't mean anything. They're intro level resin based printing, like we've been talking about, where you take the liquid resin, you put it in a vat, the light shines from the underside, and layer by layer, it freezes it one layer at a time until you get an amazing piece that just comes out of there. Amazing looking stuff, right? So, the reason I brought that up is because, well, it just started raining really hard. I gotta cut the grass. Sorry. The reason I brought this up is because some of you have been asking, okay, how do I get into this? 
what machine would you recommend? What number one machine would you recommend if you're going to get into resin printing? Because to me, resin printing is the way to go. Yes, you can do the big inserts and all sorts of big stuff like that with the other printers. But if you want quality and shine and look, go with the resin printer. Uh, which is why I recommend highly the Elgu Mars 2 Pro because, oh my gosh, it does each layer in two seconds. The first machine I ever had was eight seconds, then six seconds, and now this one is two seconds. That is such a drastic, huge increase. So I'm going to show you some footage of the machines right now. Okay, so I'm out here in the shed right now. I've got the Mars and Mars Pro, 2, Mars Pro and Mars Pro 2. It's a little loud because I'm currently printing something over here. This is for my daughter. It's not for me, but... Uh, Look pretty snazzy anyway. So here's what we're talking about. We're talking about build volume. Now looking at the Mars Pro and the Mars Pro 2, you really can't physically visibly see a difference, but when you throw them in the slicer, you can see a major difference. And the Mars 2 Pro has just enough to where you can get so much more out of it than you can with this, especially when it comes to rotating your prints certain ways to get better angles, to get better things printed. For instance, you might on this machine try to get something on there that just won't fit. You can't scale it down because it needs to fit for something else for a part of a bigger project. But here, the flexibility of that build plate is so much better. And here's the beautiful part. This has a two second printing speed, which means that every two seconds a new layer is getting printed. This one is a six second. Now combo that over here with my Photon S, this one has an eight second. So you're talking about eight seconds. This does it in two seconds. What that means is it drops down, flashes light, one, two seconds, moves up, moves down, next layer, two seconds. This would be six seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six. So we're talking about a huge difference. So for bang for your buck, I'm 100% always going to recommend the Mars 2 Pro. Even if the cost is a little bit higher, just simply for that little bit big, bigger build volume, which you may not think you'll notice, but you certainly will, and specifically for that speed. That's it. I hope you enjoy this look again. Again, we're just going to slow roll this. There's no reason to rush. We're going to talk about 3D printing. We're going to talk about resin 3D printing. Let me know what you want to know about 3D printing in the comments down below. Hope you enjoy. I'll see you soon. Enjoy breakfast. I don't know what you're eating, but enjoy. Probably like steak tartare. Is that breakfast? I don't know. I'm from the south. We got shrimp and grits. Enjoy. You might wonder if it's possible to own too many 3D printers. Hmm. Anyhow, all right, so we're taking a look at stuff that's in the Board Game Geek store. I should mention that as the beginning of July here, they are adding in a pile of Dice Tower things to the store. Many of our old, 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 old promos. Um, but if you want to get them, the money does support the Dice Tower. But uh, these are things that they have. So they have this game, Castello Methani from Leo Calavini. I've not played this game. It actually isn't a Dice Tower library, but I've heard good things about it. Um, so there you go. That game's there. Also, here, this game is not in the library. This is Aqualin. Uh, where's the cover? There we go, the cover. And you can get a bag for the tiles. Ooh, Aqualin's actually a very good two-player game. And some nice tiles here. Ooh, how pretty. And that fits in a box. Not a necessary thing, that's for sure. But I guess you actually don't even need the... Well, you do need the board, I guess. So you could put everything in a box. Anyway, well, now we're going to look at the coolest thing that we're looking at today. And that is Yellow and Yangtze. Yellow and Yangtze is the sequel to Tigers and Euphrates. And it comes with some really nice wooden tiles for your leaders. And then it comes with some pretty decent um, cardboard tiles. But I don't, those, you know what these cardboard tiles are? Trash. You know why? Because you can buy these. These are amazing. All right. So uh, here's the original tile. They're now wooden tiles or bamboo maybe. These are with like, I think they're, they're wooden here. Or at least it's faux wood um, with a plastic top to them. These are amazing. These are fantastic. I mean, look at this. It's replacing all the tiles in the game. And we got the, the black tiles, the red tiles, the wild yellow tiles, the green tiles. It's the same artwork. I think the artwork for the game is fantastic. Vincent Dutrait artwork. But now on these tiles. And it comes in its gorgeous box, which I'm not going to keep. 
because I'm going to put everything into the original game. Because any original game already has nice wooden components and wooden things, this just fulfills it to make it a fantastic looking game. If you're a fan of Yellow and Yangtze, this is not even a question. You gotta get it. All right, let's move on. Hi everyone, I'm Clara and I talk about board games and I talk about physical and digital versions and today's game is one that I've played digitally but I've not played it physically. And to be honest, I think I'd be a little bit daunted about playing the physical version. The game that I'm going to talk about today is a deck building game called uh, Ascension. So Ascension has become a, a real favourite of mine over the last year. I didn't even realise that I liked deck builders. The only one that I really played previously was a little bit of Star Realms and a lot of Seasons. I think when you look at these deck building games, they always seem quite daunting. And with Ascension, you've got a whole bunch of cards and then there's loads and loads of expansions. And it's like, well, which ones are the best? How do I know? How much money does it cost? Let's be honest, I don't have loads of money. Also takes up a lot of space. Now with Ascension, there's a lot of expansions available online. This is the Steam version and I've bought them all, but all of them were fairly cheap. It didn't impact my wallet too heavily. And so that's it. I think if I'd seen it, it's a game that I want to play physically, but I think that I remember seeing my friend's collection of Dominion and they had everything crammed into three big boxes and they were just packed. And I'm like, the setup and just getting into it and learning and understanding all those cards, it seems too much. And of course, if you're playing a, a deck builder with someone who really knows the decks, then you're going to get whooped. But because this is an online version, um, it doesn't take up any space. It was fairly cheap. I don't have to worry about storing it. And also I can play it solo. So I got to learn the decks, but I don't know them all perfectly. I do like the fact that you're not um, building up an army to fight your opponent, but you're actually fighting a deck of monsters in the middle of the deck. That feels a little bit different to me. And I like that. Uh, but yeah, I'd love to play the physical version. But for me, I think that I'm happy having the digital version. I'm curious about the uh, sort of expanded board game version. But uh, I guess we'll see when it comes out. Okay, till next time. Bye bye. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Tim. I'm Lizzie, and we are to play or not to play. Today we are continuing our look at small portable games you can take on your holidays. Mm. And this is Bibios today. Mm -hmm. Two to four players. It says thirty minutes, but we usually didn't play in thirty minutes. Thirty minutes. Fifteen. Now. Minutes? 15 yeah, probably get two games in thirty minutes. Yeah. Um, and yes. It's like, and it's actually a little Bible. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, so this is a. a uh, Steve Finn design uh, produced by Yellow, Iello, um, and it's basically a set collection, um, oh. dice manipulation, and auction game. All three things in one comes in two phases: the set collection phase and then the auction phase. Uh, and you manipulate the dice by special cards that you turn over, and you want to put your dice color up and the opponent's mm -hmm. dice color down. And the one with the most points in a certain set colour at the end Get wins dice. those dice and those points that are showing. It's Dead a great simple. little card game. I wasn't sure about the theme saying, like, do you want to play Biblios? Mm, yeah, theme's sure. a bit thin. And... But it's a good little card game, actually. I do really enjoy it. Yeah. It's not heavy. I agree. So it's, it's got kind of both things, dice and cards. So if you like one of those, or both. Ooh. Yeah. And it's small. I mean, it's you small. can you can take that as if you were taking a book on holiday, but obviously yeah. you could just half the size of it because it's just a pack of cards and five dice. You could That's put it in true. a smaller tin again. Yeah, really good. good Recommended. Stuff. Yeah, definitely. So check out our channel for some more two-player reviews. Yeah. Uh, we're two-player not to play. And uh, hopefully you will like this one for your holidays. <laughs> Enjoy. Bye. All right, everybody. Let's see what's coming up this week. We got a, a, a podcast. Eric and I are releasing a podcast tomorrow about top 10 unknown children's games but we got other stuff coming up here um i'm doing z is playing an app in just a bit at 10 o'clock i'm doing a q a at noon uh chris is reviewing critter cruise this afternoon and then tomorrow we got a boring unboxing and shoots and marbles at three o'clock as well as I'm reviewing several different games this week. Uh, Dice Miner, uh, a classic game of Starfares and Catan. The Terrible Battleship, Outer Space. Uh, on the Rocks, The Key, the Taco Bell board game. <laughs> Last message, UFO Boom. I thought I had reviewed the, yes, the combo of life slash trouble. Um, <sighs> 
There's a few good reviews this week for sure, but there's lots of other stuff coming your way. I'll be talking about my top 10 theme park games later on in this week. A good chunk of this week is us preparing for uh, next week, which is the Summer Spectacular, but we do have stuff going out, and much of our live things are going out. Like I said, Shoots and Marbles tomorrow, Q&A today, uh, and Z's uh, What's Happening Wednesday. We're doing crowd surfing, and our live board game breakfast Thursday. So stay tuned for all that. And that's what's coming from the Dice Tower. Summer's here! Are you crazy? We're going to be inside playing games all summer. Yes! <laughs> A game that we love for the summer that is relaxing and casual, perfect for the summer for us is Bonanza by Rosenberg. You plant, then harvest your beans to gain coins. Fatti non fosti per vivere come bruti. It's in the box, it's in the box, it's in the Italian box. It's a, game. It's a hand management, it's a collection game. The hard part is that every turn you must plant a bean, one or two beans in one of your fields, but fields can contain only one type of bean. And if you can't play the card, you gotta clear the, the field to plant it. And it's not always good because you wanna harvest a field when you have a lot of beans to earn a lot of coins. Molly, how do you win Bonanza? Well, number one, I would say uh, do whatever you can to get that third field. Um, the third field allows you to plant more beans, so you get more coins, which helps you win the game. Uh, and number two is focus on getting the rare high reward beans, because it's a game changer in the end. What he said. This is a segment where we take a look at a board game based on an IP, and I tell you if the IP and the mechanisms fit together. Today we're looking at WWE Cage Match. Let me show you how it plays, I'll come back and tell you if the IP and the mechanisms match. So this is how you set up the WWE Cage Match. You're going to have a little thing that will go in here. This is the box with the four holes in it. You will choose four WWE superstars, and there is a ton to choose from, an equal number of females and males that are in the game. Each wrestler will have their own power, which will be listed here and an individualized dice that will be for them. For example, this one single dice is Triple H. To start the game out, you have these four dots right here. You will put it on one of these and you will flick it in. Once everybody has flicked all their dice into the game, if your thing is stunned, you cannot pick it up, but if it's not a stunned one, you can put it on the outside on your turn and flick it inside. If it happens to show the logo of the wrestler, then you don't have to be on one of the dots. You can put it anywhere you want and kind of flick it in. If all of your wrestlers are stunned or they've been pinned, which is falling through the hole, then you will lose the game. So what you're trying to do is get all of your opponents pinned through the holes or have them all stunned as you flick these dice in there and try to maneuver them as you go. You win two out of three falls. You are the winner of WWE Cage Match. Well, the IP and the mechanisms match in the fact that it's just a chaotic battle royal kind of cage match that you're going to be having. Wrestlers will be everywhere. Everybody's going to have a unique power, which is kind of neat. And everybody's going to have a unique die. And that's kind of interesting in it. At the end of the day, you're just flicking dice and hoping for the best. Very chaotic, very random and luck fest. Yet, we had a pretty good time with it. Does it feel like the wrestling? I think so. Just the chaotic nature of it. How bodies are flying everywhere and you want to pin them in the ropes. I think it all works kind of well in here. This is something light that you'll play with your children. It's not something you take too seriously. Not a lot of strategy involved. The chaos and luck is high. Just like a good WWE Survivor Series cage match, Royal Rumble-esque battle royal. And it has a lot of the classic wrestlers in here that are going to appeal to a lot of people. I do like the Royal Rumble card game that came out better. But this is going to fit the mechanisms and the IP just as well with a flick of that die.
So a couple things here. As he was going over that cage match, I was like, I know I played that game, but I haven't played the WWE version. I looked it up, and it is a re-implementation of Kung Fu Zoo, which came out from WizKids in 2016. Um, the wrestling match probably makes more sense because the Kung Fu Zoo was animals wrestling each other. But it's a silly, fun dexterity game. I guess it works with the wrestling theme. As to Bonanza... You don't always need to get your third field in Bonanza. I might disagree with that strategy tip. Sometimes it's worth getting a third field, but sometimes it's, you're okay with two. Um, third gives you more options, but I've seen many people win having just two fields. All right, let's talk about trends in the industry. So these are just 10 random trends in the industry, and I might do a sequel to this next week or a week in the future or never. Uh, um, but uh, I just... This is my observations, but I believe my observations are not, I'm hesitant to call them fact, obviously, but I do talk to a lot of people involved in the industry, so who knows? These are just things I've noticed about the industry. So first of all, we have more companies are selling their games directly online than I've ever seen before. Now, part of this is Kickstarter. Kickstarter is now a major force in our hobby, and a lot of companies are using Kickstarter, sometimes blatantly, as a pre-order system. I mean, it's not even close to pretending at this point, you know. Uh, there's the, the most obvious of obvious is like Queen and Eagle Griffin. That's, they're just straight up selling their games through, uh, through Kickstarter to all the other companies who try to, you know, obscure that a little bit. But the fact of the matter is mo many, many companies are doing that. There are many companies who sell directly from their website or have their own shop set up on Amazon and other places where they are directly selling their games. I have never seen this much of that online selling of games. And a lot of times, many of these games never go to retail. So that's a thing. Taking out the whole argument about the friendly local gaming store, the unfriendly local gaming store, whatever, taking that out, a lot of companies are just bypassing that in general or are releasing a vastly inferior um, component-wise game or even sometimes stripped-down mechanism game to stores and the only way to get the good one is by backing the Kickstarter or going online. So I think that's a, a, that, that's a trend that's definitely happening in the industry. Okay, number two, Zoom and other things. Uh, people are using them to play more online games. And we're seeing Board Game Arena, Tabletop Simulator, Tabletopia. Those are the big three. Those are the three I just mentioned. Not to mention all the iOS and Android stuff or Switch or other ways to play games online. That's definitely increasing. It's increasing to a point where... Um, it's bringing more people into the hobby, in my opinion, because people will play the game and then go out and hunt the physical. Occasionally, these games kind of uh, destroy people wanting to play the actual physical game of whatever the copy might be. Um, but there's a lot of online play. A lot of this was obviously caused by people being forced to stay inside for a half year, a year. Um, but uh, on the flip side, Online playing is increasing, but I do not believe that online conventions are a thing. Online conventions, I shouldn't say aren't a thing. I don't think online conventions are going to be a major force in our hobby going forward. And I say this, last year we were involved in a couple of them. We put a lot of effort into them. What we do next week, where our Summer Spectacular, Spring Spectacular, those aren't really conventions. Those are just shows. They're week shows, special shows. But the online convention where you go and find other people, I know some of them work. So I'm not saying they don't work. You don't need to email me and say I had a great time at such and such con. Fantastic. But I don't foresee them being a big part of the big cons like Gen Con and Origins and Board Game Geek Con and cons like that. I think that those, those conventions will put one out on. I just don't think it's going to matter. The resources put into it aren't going to be that big of a deal, and not that many people will attend them. Not that many people attended online cons last year, and if ever there was a year to attend an online con, it was the year 2020. So I just don't see that taking off. It hasn't so far. Um, production of games, number three here. 
I think that we've gotten to a point where we are pushing, and I've talked about this a lot, so this is one of my hobby horses, but the all-in-one production, the mega boxes, the get it, you know, it used to be a rare thing to see a deluxe version of a game. It is no longer a rare thing. Companies are kickstarting a game along with everything that they can think of. Some of it Often we're wondering if it was even play tested, thrown into the game. Extra pieces, giant boxes. We live in a consumption age. About five years ago, I was a little concerned about the micro games. I talked about them. I said, I don't want every game to be tiny. We may have overcorrected on that. Um, it's, there are still small companies making small games, but the big ones are the ones dominating. The big ones are the ones people talking about, and they're giant and overwhelming um, and I don't see this ending anytime soon. Now, that being said, production is going up everywhere. We often, back in the day, I remember in the year 2004 when Ticket to Ride came out, and then we were talking about Days of Wonder production was just, they were the top of their game. But the fact of the matter is that everyone is at the top of their game. Production is just good across the board. When I do my look backs each week and I go back and look at games 10 years ago, there are many of them and I think I would not even have looked at that game now because of the production values. I want my games to have good production values. I think it's a good thing for the hobby. Now, yes, we've obviously overcorrected and there's a lot of function or form over function, which I talked about um, last week where games are so cool looking, but they're harder to play. So there's some of that that needs to be fixed. But for the most part, man, when you open up a box now, you're like, that's cool, that's cool. And a game that's not as neat as the others, you're like, this production's not very good. Well, 10 years ago, we would have thought that was an amazing production. Rule books. We're in the year 2021. Rule books have not gotten that much better in the past 20 years. Isn't that weird? We play all these games, the production keeps going up, but rule books are not getting better. Now, I think part of this is because of a crutch that exists, and that is online tutorials. Now, don't get me wrong, I think online tutorials, you know, the, from watch it play to other play, people showing you how to play a game, that's great. I like when I get a rule book and there is a, a code there that I can scan and find the rules for the game. But that doesn't excuse you from writing a good rule book. But I really believe a lot of companies do. They'll figure somebody will go online and show how to play the game. And this is a trend in the industry I'm, I'm, I have a problem with. And that's that companies are putting a lot of effort into the production of their games and the art of their games. And I would argue the quality of gameplay. But they're not putting it into rule books. Yes, there are a few good rule books out there, but constantly we are talking about how bad rule books are. And yes, there are rule book apologists out there, but the fact of the matter is you can make a good rule book. And I think that the, the knowing you can fall back on someone explaining it online isn't good enough because that is not always available to everybody. The rule book needs to be good. Um, Cons. I mentioned uh, board game conventions earlier. Well, currently, board game conventions are not supreme. They were. How do you know this? Look at the dice tower the past five, six years. We Gen Con, Gen Con, Gen Con, Gen Con, Gen Con, S and S and S and S and S and Gen Con, Gen Con, Gen Con. I mean, that's where it was at, right? There was no Gen Con last year. There was no Spiel convention in S and last year. They did not happen, and the hobby did not die. And in fact, many companies are not going back to conventions this year even with the opportunities to go to them. And there's talk about, will that happen? Now, part of this is good. I'm happy that we don't have a flood of games at Gen Con and a flood of games at Essen. Instead, the games are being kind of more spread out over the course of a year. I think that's good for the consumer. That being said, I'm curious to see where this will be. Will cons regain their footing? Will next year, 2022 Gen Con, again, be the thing everybody has to go to? Because as proven, you don't have to go to a con to do well at things. So will the medium cons suffer, like Origins and Board Game Geek Con? And, or will the cons where people go to play games, like Board Game Geek Con, kind of rise above, and the cons that cost a lot of money, <coughs> Gen Con! you know, go down some because of, well, hey, why spend all that money when I get people to play my games in other ways? Um, all right, number eight. Without cons, though, games are disappearing faster. 
I have never in my life, in my gaming life, seen a game come out and disappear so fast. And I'm not talking about bad games. I'm talking about not good games. I'm talking about excellent games are consistently being released. People are like interesting and it's like flying by a, on a driving by on a speedway and you quick see a game and it's gone. Very few games have any kind of lasting now that's always been the case, right? If I say name some great games from the year, you know, 2015, you when you went and looked there, you might know five, ten of those names. But it's even more of a problem now, and this is a problem for board game companies because they'll put out a good game from a company that has a, a good reputation, from a highly known game designer with amazing artwork, and the game is good and solid or even better than good, and poof, it's gone in a couple months. It has just disappeared. It is the rare game that lasts longer. Um, so I, this is, I don't think this is necessarily a good thing for the hobby, but it is a thing that's happening. Um, so, number nine, IPs are often good intellectual properties. We just had a segment about intellectual properties, and now a lot of this is from Prospero Hall, but I mean other companies have intellectual properties. We see multiple games coming out from Dune this year that we assume will be good. From Portal and Gale Force 9, we see all these different companies taking intellectual properties, which is something that we used to be like, these aren't very good, um, but now an intellectual property does not mean a game is bad. It just means it's a good game with a theme that you might connect to. That's exciting. As a side note here, though, Hasbro sucks. All right? I just want to be clear on that. I almost made that a separate point, just called Hasbro still sucks. But they do. And if they make an intellectual property game, it's terrible, and don't buy it. Also, don't buy any Hasbro game right now, because apparently there's a bunch of monkeys running the place on typewriters just typing, and that's the rules for a game, and I'm getting really mad here again. Uh, I've, come on, Hasbro! Okay, number 10. <laughs> there's a lot of nature themes, and a lot of critter themes. I probably should have reversed these, because that's not a very big uh, thing point to end on. Uh, Chris, you gave me this idea, <laughs> if you think it's a bad one. Um, no, but this is true, and I'm glad for this, actually. I think the nature, I think, let's give credit, I think Wingspan kicked this door open. But it wasn't just Wingspan. We saw Photosynthesis and other games come out, um, and, and Everdell, and just the idea of this. And I think the, this kind of theme appeals to a lot of people. My dad loved watching birds. I never understood it. It's really boring to me. But he was not alone. The whole Audubon Society likes to watch birds, and there are people who like animals. And Okay, that's a lie. I fill my uh, window sills here with bird seeds so the birds come and land on them because I like birds. I like animals. And I think this is a very popular theme at this point in time. And so uh, there you go. All right, those are 10 uh, trends in the industry. Got any more? Mention them in the comments. I might bring it up in a future episode. Let's keep moving. So welcome to another Shoots and Marbles Highlights of the Week. Let's look at these last Tuesday's races and see what some of the best moments were. Let's check the footage. We're starting here with Tentaswirl in a solid lead. Oh, tentatively forgetting that they're in a race and Dove is able to sneak by qualifying for the finals. In the next qualifying race, Snot Rock in the front, 50-50 bar in the back. 50-50 bar is the racer to watch as they break away from the pack, take an outside lane and are able to take an explosive impactful victory sneaking past Snot Rocket. Don't want to be on the receiving end of that. Here we've got Earth and Frappuccino fighting it on. Frappuccino taking a cheap shot, a dig at Earth. Earth is almost unable to recover. They're knocked off four racers in the lead. But what's this? Earth qualifying for the finals. Now in the finals races, these are the ones worth points. Look at Flower Power with a complete breakaway. They can take it all the way. Oh, they can take a nap, actually, is what they're going to do. Oh, they wake up. They forget that they're in a race. Might as well finish what they started. And Flower Power taking first place, a solid 15 points. But check out this new amazing launcher. This is the debut race of the, of the uh, Cyclone Launcher by David from Woodfish Toys. Earth trying to qualify. Earth hitting everything. Earth hitting everything. That green marble cannot catch a break. They are so far behind in the pack here, but look what they do. They take a, an unconventional approach. They're able to bounce ahead here into third place, which, folks, third place in the final race is a triple point race. That'll be 45 points along with another bonus. That is enough to bring them to be the leader, the winner of today's races. 
And that, folks, is Shoots and Marbles. You can catch that live Tuesdays here at the Dice Tower, 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's Shoots and Marbles. We'll see you there. That everything that Chris says about Shoots and Marbles is not exaggeration. It is that cool and that fun. Join us tomorrow as we do that again. So I'm excited about that. Let me tell you something I'm also excited about. <laughs> That's Fingerbot. So if you don't know what Fingerbot is, we've been talking about Fingerbot a lot in crowd surfing because it was on Kickstarter, but that was like the Fingerbot Extreme. Fingerbot what? Pro. Pro. This is just boring old Fingerbot. Uh, I went online and found you could buy one, so I did. So, if you turn this on, oh, well, well, anyway, you turn it on, you can charge it, so you hook it up with your phone. And then what you're supposed to be able to do is you can set this up as a remote control. All right, Fingerbot is offline. Let's turn it on. Let's get it online. Here, I tested this out earlier. Of course, it's not going to work now, which, of course, is, uh, come on, Fingerbot, get online. There we go. Online, online, connect. There we go. So now it's iLink. So now I can press a button here and watch. What? <laughs> I can press the button and it pushes down. Now, you can set it so that it, that's a down movement, but I can also set it so that it's an up movement. <laughs> but not only that, I can also, oh wait, no, sorry, hang on. I can set it to, uh, where's the other thing I can change it to? Oh, instead of click, I can just change it to switch. So I can press it so it goes down and we're up. So the other one, it went down, up, like pushing a button. This, it just switches from one to the other. Okay, so what is the use of this? By the way, this is a pretty terrible app. Um, the, the usefulness of this is, hey, I can put this on a button and then as a remote control or I can set a timer up, it can push that button. Now, you might be thinking, what buttons would this be good for? I agree, because we all thought this over. We haven't yet come up with an idea. But the biggest problem is, is this. Now, you can't see very well, but this push button down comes barely lower than the edge of this. So if I glue this to a wall or something, unless the button is an extended button, like an old 1960s launch a rocket type button, this is not going to press them. So we tried this on a light switch. Its power is barely enough to push the light switch. It pushes it halfway. Uh, we tried it on electronic devices, but the thing doesn't come down far enough to push those, like an iPhone or something. We tried it on the Roomba, which I thought would be the best use of this, to put it on the Roomba and have it drive the Roomba around, and it's not strong enough to push that button down. We tried it on the camera that you are watching on here, and it's okay, but there's no good place to put this surface to stick on the camera. In short, this is a waste of money. <laughs> um, it's a funny concept, and maybe the Fingerbot Pro is the answer to all my solutions. But the fact is, this stick does not extend from here enough to do anything. It's already a dumb idea. All right, I mean, again, if you want something to be electronically fixed in your place, there are other ways to do it. You want to turn your lights on and off? Uh, Alexa will do it for you. You can find switches and things to do that. You can buy devices with that built in. Apple makes a variety of products that work with the iPhone and such. I don't know the Android equivalents, but I know stuff like that exists. There's all kinds of smartphone devices. This is more silly than anything else, and we certainly have had our fill of, of laughing about it at the end here. But I can't think of one good practical thing I can use this for. The best thing we thought of was for the cameras, because the cameras we use don't have a remote control. So, oh, okay, we can do that. But again, the weird size of this, and then you have to hook your, your, your phone up to it and pressing it on and off. That's a lot of work and effort for something that looks clunky and doesn't work very well. So, um, yeah, someone said here on the, in the chat that it has a, uh, a great song. I agree. The great Fingerbot song coming to Spotify from Z Garcia. Uh, I wanted to like this. Maybe the Fingerbot Pro will come down farther. But even if it's worked amazing, it's still hard to think of a lot of really useful applications for it. Again, light switches can be already automated. Most lights can be automated. I just want one for the Roomba. I just want to drive my Roomba. You know what, though? I bet you the new Roombas have a, an app built into them that you can do that with anyway. So 
That's Fingerbot. Sorry. It did not fall off the table, but it came awfully close. Let's keep moving. Nice edit. Hey there, fellow gamers, and welcome to another Tabletop Toolbox episode of It's, it's Out Now, where I take a look at recently delivered Kickstarter games to determine if they were worth the wait. And today I'm introducing you to one of my other favorite hobbies. This is the sport of disc golf. Now, I got into disc golf back in 2019, but the sport has exploded over the past year as people have looked for an affordable way to get outside, get some exercise, and engage in some friendly competition. Of course, if the weather's bad, well, then we've got some disc golf board games. And first up is Birdie by the Boda Brothers. Now, admittedly, this game came out last year, and I'm going to kind of gloss over it because it's, it's terrible. In addition to lousy component quality and laughable art design, Birdie is essentially a roll and move game. You roll some dice, and based on the numbers in your current location, move your disc to the symbol with the value closest to but lower than the value you roll. Now you've got some skill tokens and some karma cards that you can spend, but these mostly just change the configuration of the dice that you're rolling. That means that you still have a pretty good chance of throwing your shot in the drink and reduces this to pretty much just a luck fest. But that's okay because up next we've got Final Nine, which is a small card game from an indie publisher in Australia called Monkey Mind Games. In this box of cards is an 18-hole disc golf course, an assortment of discs, and a wide variety of action cards. You select the disc with the flight path you want, and then play any blue skill cards from your hand, which lets you alter the flight path of the chosen disc. You then draw the top card from the action deck. If it's gray or red, it could have a negative impact, but then you get to play any gold luck cards from your hand to try and save the shot. While Final Nine does still run the risk of some bad luck, the mitigation options in here are much more solid, and honestly, this just feels like a realistic game of disc golf, with all of its unpredictability included here in the box. Now, the Boda Brothers have used some industry sponsorship to help make Birdie readily available, but you can get Final Nine from some online disc golf retailers. Go to their website to help find the retailer nearest you. A big shout out to my friend Grant for helping me out with the intro to this video, and until we see each other again, happy chaining. Cheers. I wonder how many times he did that last shot. Maybe he did it the first time. Five times, I'm saying. Okay. Anyhow, folks, thanks so much for watching Board Game Breakfast. If you're just joining us now, you missed a great contest for the loop at the very beginning of the episode, so you want to slide back in there. Don't turn off your computers. All you got to do is just idle them for 18 minutes, leave them on, on neutral, and Z will be back with a live at play at 10 o'clock. And then I'll be back for a Q&A at noon. I'll see you all then. Until next time, though, and thanks to all my amazing contributors, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Have fun with Fingerbot. Oh, don't, 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 don't. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production.